can we like complain that we're off synced sunk sunk or off sync yeah i'm gonna sync. i'll send a thing after this why do you can you tell too you're just it, you look like an old kung fu movie i guess <laughs> it's like your mouth keeps going after you're done talking you know stop it it's after oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry i can't stop now. stop i can't <laughs> it's who i am now you become addicted to it okay <laughs> Oh, shit. All right, everybody. Welcome to SVU Pod, especially heinous. I'm Gabe. I'm Tasha. <laughs> Sorry. You're on. I'm uh, Tasha. <laughs> it sounded really pathetic. <laughs> we are in season five, episode four, Loss. Let's have a moment of silence for this extremely intense episode that we're all about to get into together. Mm -hmm. This is a big one. Yeah. I didn't know until the very end. I forgot. <laughs> I've forgotten like all of these episodes. They'll just be like something every now and then where I'm like, I kind of remember. Her, I do too. Her yeah. Being in a van. Whenever I'm like, <laughs> I, oh, I'm making this incredible prediction. Then I'm like, am I making this out of the recesses of my memory or am I really that good? All right. Opening scene. There's this bougie woman and she's walking her poodle and has like a little bow in its hair. It's super cute. She's talking about how she's going to make him some toast and he's going to love it. <sighs> this lady is future you, by the way, Tasha. <gasps> okay. <laughs> and you know it. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, she has this ch – God, I can't think of what her name is. This little voice. I just remember seeing her. She's got really big titties, and I saw her on Sesame Street when I was a kid. But the way she was talking to the dog, she's like, when we get home, Mommy's going to fix you a nice piece of toast. Would you like that? Oh, Tootsie. She was just very, like, baby <laughs> yeah. old lady voice. And I did say this woman is covered in my life goals until she lets her dog shit in the street without picking it up. There, I Yeah, I, that I was the only thing. Uh -huh. That was the only thing I was like, Tasha would never do that. I would never. But, so the dog walks in between two parked cars, and she's like, good boy. He looks around, and she's like, I'll just leave it. She just lets him shit in the street. Ugh. Then the dog Tootsie goes over to some bags of garbage and the lady sees a fur coat in the trash and gets super pumped. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, oh shit, I'm taking this fucking dumpster jacket. <laughs> yeah. And then I was like, would Tasha do that? I mean, no matter how much money she has, you're always looking for a deal. You got that blood in you, okay, you know? Let me tell you, I love a deal. And also upon initial, like I would definitely pick it up and look at it. Cause one, don't throw fur in the trash. It's already been through enough. Mm hmm you know you're right yeah two yeah i'm gonna look for signs of wear and tear and stains i'll give it a whiff take it to the dry cleaners and if nothing else i would give it to my mother to use it for scraps because she makes teddy bears out of like old yeah but then again shit. we're also in new york so we might be a little like mm, do i want to pick up new york for garbage mm. you know what i mean i don't know man the way it looked it wasn't matted or anything like that shit looked nice that's true. So yeah, I would I would take a trash bag for a coat is what I'm getting at. <laughs> I know that about you. Mm. The woman starts moving bags of garbage and uncovers the fur and there's fucking legs sticking out of it. And there's a lady's face and it's like bashed in or ripped off or oh. something. It's pretty intense. Yeah. It was like very purple, her face. Yeah. Benson and Stabler arrive and there's a whole crime scene unit there. A cop tells them that the victim is Livia Tejas. She's 23 years old and from Queens. She was found naked with her pocketbook, money, and ID still in it. Then the guy says, the old bat wants the fur when you're done. And I was like, geez, that was unnecessary. But They're not going to give it to her, right? They wouldn't, no. Like, that's evidence. But I was like, you don't have to call her an old bat. Jeez. Yeah, but maybe she was a bitch like, about the it. the psycho bitch wants the... <laughs> yeah, she probably was. Hey, that lady who let her dog shit in the street uh that I stepped in? Yeah, she wants the fur coat. <laughs> Coroner Warner is on the scene. The victim's been dead less than 12 hours. No stab or gunshot wounds. She was beat to death in the face and left side of her body. The rape kit is positive for fluids. She was moved after she was killed and her fucking tongue was cut out. Ugh. Coroner Warner thinks that she said something she shouldn't have. Like it was a message. Yeah. She didn't find the tongue and says they might want to check out the dog. And then you see the dog. <laughs> the camera closes in on the dog looking at them sideways <laughs> like, did I eat that tongue? It goes like real. The camera pans really far through the whole alley, right up to yeah. the dog. Like, yeah, that whole that whole thing hair. gave me the mouthwater <laughs> gags. Uh, like thinking about that. It's gross. Yeah. Theme song. <laughs> Munch and Toot speak with the landlord. And <laughs> a ba 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 ba. A ba 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 ba. Okay, let's stop. I was gonna stop. try to do a steel drum. 
<laughs> bing, 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 bing. Bunch and Toots are speaking with the landlord and they're searching Livia's apartment. The landlord didn't know her very well, and but he thought she was really nice. She didn't have any rental references on her lease application and the dude figured she was an illegal immigrant, but he didn't ask too many questions because like everybody in that building didn't have rental references. I liked his attitude about it because it was like... Immigrants built New York. Immigrants fucking... Yeah made this country so whatever and i was like yeah goddamn right she lived in the apartment for two years but it didn't look super homey there was like nothing on the walls no furniture and he said she wasn't around much benson finds a plane ticket to miami along with designer clothing or quote ho gear as toots calls it there's gotta be 50 grand worth of ho gear here it's like immediately they're like oh she's a sex worker of course what why do they always do that so munch finds a social security card and it turns out she's not an illegal immigrant or something i guess i don't know well she has a yeah a social security card for something i don't like saying illegal immigrant Uh, how do you what's the undocumented uh, undocumented immigrant or whatever back at the precinct where the whole gang's hanging and sharing info stabler lets craig and know that there was no activity found on the social security number before june 2001 olivia says it's the same time her credit cards and driver's license were issued she's got no bank accounts Mm. no student loans no credit cards munch and toots had canvassed the building and nobody knew her other than in passing they couldn't find any family or friends craigan says there's no way it's identity Mm. theft since this woman's identity didn't even exist before this she disappeared out of nowhere Mm -hmm. they -hmm. already checked and she's not in witness protection munch goes i know you guys are gonna give me conspiracy theory shit but i think she's a spy Craigan's like, cool, buddy. That that sounds great. But before we call the CIA, let's get more info off of the body first. Smart. Yeah, they're really going off of nothing. Jesus. Yeah. In the ME's office, the talk screen is positive for cocaine. A necklace was found tangled in her hair, but it only has her prints on it. It's got a pendant with Mother Mary and sweet baby Jesus. It's indicating that she's Catholic. Mm-hmm. So they're like, ooh, she's a Catholic Latino. That narrows down her community. Fiberglass is found in mm-hmm. a scrape on her leg, and the lab also found cocaine embedded in her fur coat because she was fucking covered in it. It could be signs of where her murder took place. Outside of the Emmy office, Benson and Stabler walk and talk and speculate. The victim could be a dealer or a sex worker that was helping distribute the cocaine. That would explain the trip to Miami. Benny stops on the street and she's like, yeah, hmm, just chatting. And Stabler side eyes and goes, uh, keep walking. He's clocked a Chevy Caprice with two dudes inside parked across the street and told Benny that it was there before they went in to talk to Corner Warner. All of a sudden, Benson and Stabler <laughs> spin on their heels and start running toward the car to confront the men, but then the car speeds off. What the f- Fuck. Not suspiciously at all. Why didn't they <laughs> pretend to not notice, walk past the car to get closer, get a better eye on them? It's just weird. They're like, don't be suspicious. <laughs> don't. <laughs> and just like run. They're like, hey, you guys in the car over there. <laughs> no, don't drive away. <laughs> Benson wonders if it's internal affairs as they walk down the middle of a New York City street, just the middle of the dang street, and Stabler Mm -hmm. goes, let the rats spin their wheels. Hey, let me check out that necklace again. He's looking at it, and he calls Livia a, quote, hooker with a soul, which I hated, Mm -hmm. and decided they needed to chat with Sister Peg because she may know Livia. Whee! Let's go see her. We love Sister Peg. Everybody loves fucking Sister P. S P. Yeah. Sissy P. Sis, uh, sister Peg. Sister Peg is a cute enough little nickname. We don't need to nickname her nickname. Yeah. Benson and Stabler head over to Sister Peg's mobile help unit. They show Sister Peg a photo of Livia, but she says that she doesn't know her. Stabler then starts helping Sister Peg load up her vehicle, but not without judging sex work. He's like, dental dams, mm-hmm. a thousand count. Business must be booming. Like his teenage daughter, Marine, doesn't have a mouthful of braces and dicks. Fuck <laughs> you. <laughs> stabler you judgy motherfucker you work yeah. in sex crimes Ugh. right but she's just like yep they need to be supplied here i am fucking legit doing the lord's yep, work can't keep them off the shelf they show peg the necklace and she immediately knows it's the patroness of columbia our lady of the rosary of chikinkira probably where the victim is from peg also lets them know that saint augustine's in queens has a lot of colombian congregation members maybe somebody over there knows her 
Mm-hmm. They got to go talk to fucking Father Castrion. So now we're at the church. Munch and Toots are speaking with Father Castrion. Father C hasn't seen Livia in months, and she seemed super troubled the last time he saw her about two or three months ago. He says that Livia was also very secretive about her past, but he assumed her job made her decent money. So when she joined the parish, she donated all of her furniture and wouldn't accept any money. The church picked it up from a storage unit for her. A bunch of toots are like, well, where's this storage unit? He says they hired a moving van, and then he can get the address to the storage facility from the invoice. And the pastor's tinted glasses makes me think he had something to do with his murder. (laughs) His tinted glasses. I was like, it's this guy. Benson Stabler are at Store It All Self Storage in Queens. Store it all for all your storage. Store it all for all your storage, Queens. (laughs) (laughs) Call 1-855-STORE-IT now. Ew, Tasha. (laughs) I love that. Now. (laughs) Um, Okay, Benson and Stabler find her storage unit. They're in there rooting around like little. Do you ever find yourself with too much, too much stuff and not enough storage? <laughs> Store it all, self storage queens. <laughs> and it's just these people with permed hair, like going oh, <laughs> like there's Tupperware falling. <laughs> they open their closet door and they're buried by winter coats and totes and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I want to store like, it, <sighs> but I want to self store it. But how? Have we got the deal for you? Come on <laughs> down to store it all, self storage in Queens, New York. <laughs> Two blocks from wherever you are. <laughs> Store it all, self storage. And it's his wife singing it, and it's like really bad. <laughs> <laughs> She's doing the Mariah Carey fingers to her ear. <laughs> Store it all. <laughs> the paperwork in her unit says she paid for it three years in advance. The storage. Benson unit Stabler find from Store it all, self storage. That's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. A bit, a bit. Benson Stabler find documents, family photos, and her taxes. They were filed under her real name, which is Livia Sandoval. Mm. Stabler finds a box from 2001, which is when she changed her identity. He finds a fucking police badge. Uh, Boo, boo, boo. The one thing they didn't consider. (laughs) Yeah. All of a sudden, the men from the Chevy Caprice are in the doorway. They're DEA agents Jack Hammond and Tim Donovan, and they want to talk. Don and the ham, they're not happy that those guys are in there. Now we're in Craigan's office. Craig and Benson and Stabler and the DEA agents are in there. The DEA agents want to be sure Benson and Stabler weren't working for the people they were investigating. That's why they were like, get out of here. Mm. Sandoval's prints were red flagged when they were ran in the system. So DEA agents got an alert. At the time, they didn't know she was dead. She checked in every two weeks and had checked in the week prior. The DEA agents weren't expecting to hear from her yet. Mm -hmm. There are two other undercover operatives that Livia brought in, and they're still intact. And they also say that Livia's cover is still intact. Nobody knows why she was killed. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time saying DEA. The DEA agents refused to disclose details about the case Sandoval was working on, and they can't let the public know she was a cop because then the other undercover cop's case will be blown and they'll die, probably. Cragen's like, cut the crap! <laughs> <laughs> and comes up with their case. SVU will investigate the death of Livia Tellez, a sex worker who was dating a drug dealer. That way, the DEA investigation isn't compromised and her true identity won't come out. Nobody's got to know, not the papers, not even fucking Cabot. Yeah, the guy's like, not a word to your ADA. And they're like, no fucking problem. We don't tell her shit. In the precinct interview room, Cragen, Benson, Staves, Munch, and Tooties all pile in one after the other. Cragen lets the team know that room is command central for the Tayez slash Sandoval investigation. Livia's death. The fewer people who see or hear anything about it, the better. Ooh, top secret's so fun. Toots reminds us of his drug cop background Mm -hmm. and says the Colombian cartel has a lot of people on their payroll. So Mm -hmm. reminder, everybody, this is why we want to play this close to the vest. Mm -hmm. So Livia Sandoval moved to the U.S. at 13 from Medellin and became a citizen at 18. Medellin's in Colombia. You hear Medellin, you think Pablo Escobar. It's like a whole thing. She went to the prestigious one and only Hudson University and then crushed the police exam to become a cop. And Munch is like, we're thinking Intel snatched her up for the assignment from the application pool during police academy. She is Leonardo DiCaprio in The Departed. 
Mm-hmm. It's possible that Sandoval knew someone involved in the Colombian cartel or in some form or another. Mm-hmm. Stabes goes, do we know who she was looking at? And Toots is like, could be anyone anywhere. Great addition to the brainstorm, buddy. <laughs> Could be anyone, anywhere. Wow, Toots, glad you're here. Glad you're one of the few (laughs) that know what's up. (laughs) Toots knows a trustworthy guy from narcotics that they can contact. Cut to a cemetery Toots is hanging out at. He meets the... He's actually an amateur ghost hunter and was like, I'm doing a thing. Can you meet me at the cemetery? And the guy's like, again? I don't know why. I just... He's got a little a little meter, and he's like, let's walk this way because I'm picking up a lot of activity over here. <laughs> right. But this guy from the narcotics division shows up. This dude is a cop in so many things. He's also been Omar Navarro in 23 episodes of Ozark, if that's something you watched. Never mm. watched it. but Oh, so good. I can't believe you never watched it. It's not for lack of trying. You would love it. Oh. John started watching it, and I was like, I want to watch that with you. But then it was one of those things where it's like, we're going to watch that together, and then ask me the last time we've watched anything together. You can just watch uh, on your own, because you'd love it. Uh, I just, uh, yeah. So this dude who showed up to talk to Toots is immediately annoyed, and he's like, you got to be kidding me with this deep throat crap. Mm-hmm. And tells Toots to stay away from the case. These are bad guys. Are mm-hmm. they? The guy that cut that lady's tongue out are bad guys. <laughs> Everybody with their fucking obvious statements I'm just not here for. The dude also is coming with information and thinks they're looking to extradite a man named Cesar Velez. He killed a judge and a CIA agent in Bogota a few years prior and supplies 10% of the cocaine that comes into the U.S. annually. Shit. Yeah. Cesar's cousins in Queens are involved in the day-to-day operations, cutting it up, distributing it to the Dominican dealers, etc. The narc tells Toots to talk to Felix Santos, one of the Dominican dealers, and then warns him to be careful. These guys will blow up a whole commercial airline to kill one person. There's no rules. Whoa. This kind of stuff. Gabe does not care as much for, but I'm here for the storylines. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. you don't care about like drugs and, and no getting. Th- I was stuff. It, it was just slogging through this episode. I hate this shit. Just yeah. so boring. Back at the precinct, Felix Santos is interviewed by Toots and Munch. Hey, it's fucking Bubbles from the Wire. And then he goes on to play Thirsty in Empire. And I'm like, what? Some cute names. He's so sassy, and I like him. He's dressed yeah. exactly like Jason Sudeikis in the What Up With That sketch from SNL where he does the <laughs> Yes! Isn't he? Yeah. Ooh, he like jumps in on a trouble. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> what up with that? It's funny because they like give him a regular Coke and he's like, Papa, I want a diet. He like did not <laughs> like that. <laughs> <sighs> Felix tells them he knows Livia. She gets called Cream Puff. Ew. And Felix tells them that Rafael Zapata gave her that name. Rafael is lieutenant for Cesar Velez. Felix tells them that Livia and Rafael were porkin'. Bangin'. He'd only met her. <laughs> boop, boop. He'd only met her a couple of times, but, quote, when she got high, she got mouthy. A few weeks ago, in front of Rafael's friends, she challenged his fragile, precious Fabergé egg of a manhood and gave him <laughs> shit about not being able to get it up in the bedroom. Rafael did not like it and beat her up in front of everybody. Mm-hmm. Smacked her up so, good. Ick. Yeah. In the precinct, the gang reviews the people of interest. Rafael Zapata Guevara is over everything. He's in charge of everything. Cesar Velez is his number one dude. Zapata was arrested twice in Queens for murder and conspiracy to commit murder and was indicted each time. Someone always comes forward and confesses. Munch says that the people confessing are probably Colombian people who live in New York and Zapata threatens their family as collateral and says that he's going to like murder them and stuff. And they're like, I have to take the fall for this. My whole entire family's dead. Yeah. Zapata is in the U.S. on a work visa. He owns several cell phone and pager stores, real estate in New York and Miami, and spent $1.5 million on oil drilling, probably all for money laundering. Mm-hmm. Zapata's credit card charges on the day of the murder are he flew back from Miami on the same flight as Livia. They spent four k when they went shopping to dinner and a show. Jesus, fuck. Yeah, Toots is like, oh, they spent that kind of money. Somebody's got to remember seeing them. And I'm like, in New York? I don't right. I don't think so, but like it's not hard to spend that kind of money if you're like buying some a, a, you can buy a couple bougie things, maybe one bougie thing and go to one fancy dinner. 
and a mm-hmm. show and spend that kind of money. Yeah. You know? I'm like, yeah, totally. I, it's, not, it's not that much. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Well, I don't mean it's not that much. Like, it's a lot but for no, a night I know out, but it's like, it's yeah. not difficult to go to New York and be like, okay, Broadway tickets. We're getting yeah. fucking box seats. We're going to spend 1500 bucks to go see fucking Hamilton when that first came out. And then we're going to go to dinner and a nice <laughs> dinner. You know, yeah. we're going to go to a Michelin star restaurant. That's $700 for two people or some shit, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll pop into Louis Vuitton and buy one fucking thing. I'll buy a keychain, you know? <laughs> there, <laughs> boom, four grand is spent in one day. Yeah. So they need to tie Livia to Zapata, and people probably saw them together. Now Benson and Stabler are at the Cafe Andre. They're talking to the manager about Raphael coming into the restaurant. He says he doesn't know who that person is, and he looks really shifty. I'm sorry. I don't know that yeah. person. Was, <laughs> we get it. You're faking it. <laughs> Stabler says they'll keep his name out of it, but he still isn't cooperating. They threaten him with a charge of obstruction, and he's like, then charge me. I have a wife and three kids. I can't help you. Dude is fucking terrified. Yeah. Benson gets a call from DEA agent Donovan. He wants to meet them on the roof across the street. <laughs> Did he just have, like, binoculars on them all the time? I mean, everything <laughs> is only two blocks away, so he probably couldn't see them, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty close. On the rooftop, Donovan is pissed that Benson and Stabler are about speaking to the informant, Felix. They say that they found the informant through the NYPD narcotics, not through the DEA. Mm -hmm. They're like, is he working for both? Right. Donovan tells him not to speak to Felix ever again, and Felix has been told the same. And then Stabler asks Donovan, hey, did you tell Livia to do coke and screw Zapata to make your case, or was it her idea? And he's like, (gasps) Donovan obviously is pissed. He says, you don't know anything about her. And Stabler says, I know you were supposed to protect her, and she died. Way harsh, Ty. Yeah, dude. Donovan gets in Stabler's face, and then Stabler accuses him of feeling guilty. Dude's like, I didn't tell Livia to do drugs and stuff, (laughs) but she did what she thought she had to. Then he admits that he should have pulled her off the case, and he didn't. So he does feel guilty. Why wouldn't he? Come on, Stabler. I know. Can you imagine this happening to Olivia and somebody giving him shit? Dude, you know how many fucking chairs and coffee cups have been thrown across the room? (laughs) It would be everywhere. Yeah. Benson's trying to reason with Donovan. She says, if you don't tell us something that could implicate Zapata, then we'll never be able to make this right. We're fucking flying blind here. You have to give us something. Donovan says that he knows where Livia was killed based on the fiberglass found by Coroner Warner in her knee. In Cabot's office, Benson shows Cabot a photo of Zapata's yacht he keeps in New York. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, he must have a big dick. Sorry. (laughs) No, she goes, he must be compensating for something to need a yacht that big. So she's like, he must have a small dick. They talk about his dick a lot. Yeah. Like, is all of this centered around the fact that this guy has a small dick that doesn't work if that's the case we really need to change society you guys like that's yeah. just fucked up the hull of the yacht is made from the same fiberglass material that was found in livia's knee so they go on to tell cabot that zapata's assets are held under shell companies so nobody knew that was his boat until the confidential informant told them they're like cabby pie is this enough for a warrant and she's like yeah if the informant's reliable and they were like he is based on the nature of his job he is and they're all eyebrows all at each other they all know they're Mm -hmm. talking around some sensitive shit and cabot Mm -hmm. knows they're holding out she says she needs something more than their promises to get this warrant but she'll see what she can do fucking Mm -hmm. boom police it's a fucking raid aboard Zapata's yacht. Looks like he's having a little party. I would love to go. <laughs> Stabler calls out for Zapata, and he comes down the stairs. He's like spiral staircase with his hands up. It's yes. Like super cool. <laughs> Benson hands Zapata a warrant, and Zapata says law enforcement's always searching his property, and they never find anything. And Stabler gets boop, boop, just nose to nose with him and goes, well, this time, you don't know what we're looking for, Mm -hmm. and presses the warrant into Zapata's chest. Ever so gently. (laughs) Uh, The way he did it made me laugh really hard. He pressed it into his chest like Zapata was a vending machine, and the warrant was a dollar that was mashed up and wouldn't go in. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yes. (laughs) Like... (laughs) <laughs> and then Zapata just took it like, yeah, I can, I'll hold it. In the bedroom or berth or stateroom, if you're going to be a boat dick about it, Benson and Stabler berth. smell bleach on the mattress. Huh? Berth? B-E-R-T-H, berth. It's sleeping quarters on a on a boat. But also, like, if it's the master bedroom, it's called a stateroom. Hmm. Stabler's like, flip it. They flip this mattress over and Benson feels a damp spot. So she... Pops out her pocket knife, cuts open the mattress, blood-stained filling. 
they really got the surface stains out of that and i was impressed because it mm-hmm. was just like crisp white and then yeah bloody guts in the middle yeah back out in the living room or salon <laughs> zapata is waiting watched by the officers stabler lets him know that he's under arrest for the murder of livia Tejas. zapata tells him that they're making a very big mistake and he's cuffed and taken away <laughs> he's scary mm-hmm. and like a little hot yeah <laughs> Just like that one guy, remember? <laughs> he was another like drug guy, uh-huh. murder drug guy. He was in jail, mm, remember? Yeah. We were like, well, it's oh. that you know, it's that old adage. Uh, you're not ugly, you're just poor. So like these guys have money, so like they're getting facials and you know Botox yeah. and all that shit, right? Yeah. Now we're in the courtroom. It's Zapata's arraignment. Lionel Granger represents Zapata. <gasps> oh my god! Fun fact: This dude, Lionel Granger, he's been married to Cindy Lauper since 1991. No way. Yes. Uh, So Zapata pleads not guilty to the charges, rape in the first degree, murder in the first degree. Cabot gives the judge reasons why Zapata could be a flight risk, listing the ties to drugs, all this money he has. Granger calls Cabot bigoted because of the ties to drugs because he's Colombian. And he says that Mm -hmm. Zapata will turn over his passport. And Cabot says that the gesture is meaningless since Zapata owns a fucking private jet and personal airstrips all over the world. Right. Judge Petrovsky, we love her, by the way, and hate her. I don't know. I like her. She sets the bail at five million. Cabot goes up to Granger and was giving him shit about being on a retainer by Zapata. Then he hands her a motion to controvert the search warrant. Now we're in the chambers of Judge Petrovsky. Granger argues against the warrant Cabot issued for the search of Zapata's yacht based on the fact that the info came from a confidential informant. Granger is asking to meet the informant, which contradicts the whole meaning of confidential. Granger also argues that the fiberglass found on Livia matching the yacht could have been found on any other yachts made of the same material. And then Cabot fires back, yeah, well, this particular yacht had a blood-soaked mattress that matches the fucking victim. So the judge says she wants to interview the informant to see if he meets the test for reliability. In the precinct, Cabot tells Benson and Stabler about the judge's order to meet the informant. Benson and Stabler absolutely don't want to let the judge meet their informant and don't want to tell Cabot who he is, but they're going to have to. In the DEA New York field office, Donovan walks into a conference room where Cabot's sitting in the dark, as one does. Mm -hmm. She goes to introduce herself, and he goes, were you followed? Rude, but uh, she says she doesn't believe so. She's like, I have bangs. Nobody knows who I am anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Donovan is soups irritated that he's even there and starts peeking out the blinds and stuff. Cabot argues that his information needs to be verified, and he's all too bad. She tells him that she's not going to take no for an answer because if she doesn't give the judge the informant, the judge is going to issue a John Doe material witness order. That means that if Cabot doesn't give up his name, then she'll be found in contempt. And she's not about to go to jail to protect Donovan. He still won't agree and tells her that she can do what she wants, but at the end of the day, the blood is on her hands. Mm. Pretty much implying that she's going to get him killed. Mm -hmm. She goes, well, there's got to be a way we can do this so everyone's protected and we're all friends and have a sleepover. Uh, She doesn't get it. He's like, you really don't know anything about this, do you? Mm. Bye. I mean, all of this is bullshit, by the way. The fact that you're considered confidential until the system's like, yeah, but we need to know who you are. And if you don't tell us, we're going to make you tell us. But yes, we told you that you're protected. Is that true? I mean, I looked up a couple of the things she said when she was like, so-and-so verse whatever. And it seems very legit. Hmm. Now Cabot's across the desk from her boss, D.A. Branch. Where the shit is Donnelly, by the way? I know this is a different yeah. authority figure, but we just haven't seen her in a well, while. Well, this guy is so weird. He's like a southern toad. It's like really... Yes, he, this is... They're actually not in an office. They're in a bog. <laughs> <laughs> He's drinking a mint julep, fanning oh. himself with a piece of grass. He's got suspenders. <laughs> he asks how Cabot plans to get out of the predicament. <laughs> Cabot... <laughs> And Cabot thinks things are going to go smoothly and they can all start a paper route together. Like, she was just really could not see the danger that everybody was screaming at her. And I'm not sure why it was unlike her. And I don't think it fit her character. But she says she thinks Judge Petrovsky will subpoena the DEA agent. The warrant will stand and Zapata will go away for 25 to life. She thinks all efforts will be made to conceal Donovan's identity and that unicorns have to be real. (laughs) 
I, I, I do feel like it fits her character, actually. She's, like, unstoppable. I mean, I, and she's very smart and thinks she can get shit done. And she always does. So she doesn't, she's like, I don't understand. Like, I'm going to crush this. But it's like, hello. For sure. But she yeah. also does her fucking research. I mean, I'm going to talk about it later because obviously I'm going to talk about Pablo Escobar. But, like, it's NBD for any kind of government official or cop or judge or anybody to just get fucking their mm. car to explode. Right. You know, it's not a big deal for who they're dealing with. So for right. her to be so like, yeah, this is going to happen and this is going to happen and then it's whatever. Kind of flippant about it. It yeah. seems a little too flippant. Yeah. So DA Branch says that confidential is relative to how many people know the details of a case and how interesting the information is. And this info is juicy tea. And anyone on the receiving end is the glug, 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 Boston <laughs> Harbor. Right, Gabe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw you take a breath. I thought you were going to do your Boston Harbor joke. Oh, no. I was just like, I liked because um in the notes, she didn't write and how interesting those details are. And we both put that in there, like word for word. And I was like, friendship. Because it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it does, it, it does make a difference. Like if something's confidential and it's boring, like, yeah, great. That shit's going to stand or wraps a lot better than something that's like, oh, pull up a chair, bitch. I got to tell Kath and the kids about this. Oh, my God. I shouldn't, but I'm going to wink. Yeah, there's some stuff going on. Wink. You ever seen Blow? Wink. <laughs> right. It's crazy. It's crazy. DA Branch tells Cabot to cut Zapata a deal. So Cabot goes and meets with Granger and Zapata to discuss this deal. Mm. Granger turns down the charge of manslaughter with a sentence of 8 to 10, and Zapata's like, yeah, no, we're not doing that. Zapata doubts the informant will comply with judge's orders and implies that he may know who this informant is. Mm. Cabot tells Zapata that if he intimidates the informant, she'll have him thrown into Rikers for the remainder of the trial. And Zapata's like, you can't threaten me, bitch. <gasps> and she's like, I I just did. Mm. And normally I'd be so down with her, but she's way over her head. Yep. Granger's like, <laughs> uh oh, it is time to go. Mm -hmm. Come on, bro. Don't be slow. Like, <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> You know? Z okay. Zapata can't believe that Granger doesn't back him up because Cabot's a woman and speaking to a man this way and blah, 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 blah. He's like, you allow this? You allow a woman to speak to a man like this? And Cabot's like, yeah, guess what else? A woman can comment on your performance in the bedroom and you're not allowed to kill her. Ooh. Oh, shit. Just then Zapata jumps up like he's going to attack her. Cabot jumps back, terrified as shit. Granger, quick moves, shoves the table to trap Zapata so he doesn't physically attack Cabot's bangs. And she's fucking stupid. Startled as hell, and Granger's mm. like, "Let's not do anything stupid." If you're lost, you can look, and you will find me. Time after time, time after time, because he's there to protect him. Yeah. Zapata leaves with Granger, but eyeballs Cabot so hard on yep. his way out, and the whole time she is her bangs are a quivering. Yeah, she's a set of terrified eyeballs with bangs, quiver bangs, and shaky eyeballs. Yeah, quiver bangs. <laughs> Quiver bangs. That sounds like me <laughs> losing my virginity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Now we're in the precinct. Cabot, Benson, and Stabler are doing a walk and talk. They're talking about the meeting with Granger and Zapata. Stabler tells her that she's fucking out of her mind for making that comment about what Livia said about Zapata and his dick. And he's like, you're going to blow a two-year-long DEA investigation. All of a sudden, Cabot gets a fucking cell phone call on her clamshell. <laughs> and she has an ex parte order in Judge Petrovsky's office. Not good. In the chambers of Judge Petrovsky, DOJ and U.S. Attorney's Office reps are present. Judge Petrovsky hates this, but she's being prevented from subpoenaing Donovan on the terms that it would jeopardize the ongoing investigation, which means the evidence from the search has to be thrown out. The judge tells everyone that she doesn't ever want this many lawyers in her office at once, so fuck off. Donovan meets Cabot Benson and Stabler in the open area of the courthouse and lets her know that a threat was made. And she's like, dude, we left your name out of everything. And he's like, no, girl, the threat is against you. <gasps> no. <laughs> in the DEA field office, Cabot, Benson, and Stabler sit with Donovan and listen to a recording of the threat. It's someone speaking to an inmate in a Pennsylvania prison that is linked to Cesar Valles, and they're using all these code words like, hey, you gotta go take your girlfriend out. You gotta meet her. Here's her address, and it's fucking Cabot's address. Maybe take her jogging with her in Central Park. Oh, maybe go visit her mother. It's all code word for, like, killing the fuck out of Cabot and her mom. Mm -hmm. Donovan asks Cabot if she had noticed anyone following her or any phone issues at her office. They've assigned a federal marshal to escort her and talk about security detail. Benny Stabes and Cabot go outside. Just then Donovan 
pops out from the door behind them, and Benny and Stay pull guns on him mm-hmm. because they're both hot on high alert. And he's like, oh, sorry, guys. Real quick, real quick. Real quick, yeah. So Donovan tells Cabot that this is handled, and he says he'll testify in open court if he has to. And then I go, oh, my God, it's him, isn't it? <laughs> then, like, four seconds later, his car explodes with him in it. Anyways. <laughs> I, so I go, oh my god, it's him, isn't it? Benson asks Cabot to stay with her for the night. Stabler wants him to drive by the apartment first to make sure nothing looks off. Donovan gets in his car, starts it, and it fucking explodes. And then I go, okay, not him. <laughs> <laughs> Outside the DEA field office, responders are on scene. Cabot sits in back of an ambulance, cuts on her face. She looks shocked and sad. Donovan's body is covered up in whatever is left of the car. Benson tries to get her to leave, but DEA Hammond comes over and he's fucking pissed. And he yells at Cabot for what happened to Donovan. He's freaking out about how she wasn't careful. Donovan has two kids and she's a stupid bitch, blah, blah, blah. And Stabler tells him to relax. In the precinct, Staves is reading everyone the bomb report. The trigger was rigged to the ignition. The detonator was placed under the driver's seat. Cragen says the FBI is running details to look for signatures in the bomb for a match. For a match. For a match. (laughs) Cabot is not cabiting at all. She says it doesn't matter. She knows it has to be Cesar Velez fixing things for Zapata. But how did Velez know Donovan was the CI? Mm -hmm. Because of that sweet, sweet front porch rock chair sweet tea honey <laughs> what <laughs> it's nice and cool in the in the hot summer days <laughs> that sweet sweet tea warm today warm yesterday also that guy's the informant that's interesting shit he's gonna find it right not to mention the amount of people on their fucking payroll dude yeah if you don't think that you have fucking rats in the fucking dea please mm-hmm. come on come rats on. Rats in the walls, rats in the DEA, rats... It's fucking Bruno over there. It's it's Munch in a trench coat over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pile of Munches in a trench coat. Okay, so Munch is like, um, okay, he has your address and your mom's. He's got money, power, all kinds of people in his pocket. It's not hard for him to get any information he wants. Stabler tells Cabot that Zapata won't stop until she's dead. Mm-hmm. But Cabot's like, I don't think so, <laughs> but... <laughs> My mom and I are on protective detail. You know how effective that is. Right. Yeah. Benson's like, Cabot, Alex, BFF, there's no reason to die for this case. And Cabot says, it doesn't matter if she or someone else is on the case. It'll be the same, and she doesn't want to concede. I just realized that the ADA frog guy always calls her Alexandra. They do that in the style. Okay, sorry. No, she... She's giving this moving speech. She's like, it doesn't matter who does it, if it's me or if it's anybody else, and I don't want to concede. And then they all stand on their desks and, oh, captain, my captain, that cabin, <laughs> and agree to move forward with the investigation. Like, try calling, ask your mom's opinion first, okay? Yeah, check in with your mom. You're like, mom, you're in, uh, she's like, what are these cops doing outside, honey? Are these your friends? Are they looking for you? No, somebody threatened to kill you. Anyway night if i stopped doing my job it wouldn't be a problem but you know and she's like yeah no <laughs> she locks her front door and looks through her doily curtains i support you i'm glad you didn't get married and have kids or anything Bye. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody agrees to move forward with the investigation because cabot says something moving mm-hmm. her first call is to pull in everyone that was on the yacht during the search and see if anyone knows about livia's murder craig and asks cabot to go to his office and he gives her his old service revolver. They had expedited a carry permit for her. And she's like, without my signature? Yes, Cabot. Is it your first day? Nobody else is by the book like you. She's like, oh my God, crazy. Cragen's like, yeah, we got your fingerprints. We can do anything we want with your identity. We could kill you. <laughs> and they're gonna. Cabot's boss calls Cragen and he's like, oh, funny thing, she's right here. You need to go see that big old toad booty. <laughs> So Cabot heads off to meet with D.A. Branch. Branch tells her about his friends that were in Bogota. Cops were killed every fucking day. Pablo Escobar set off nine car bombs in two months. And she says in quiet sarcasm, well, it's good we live in the United States. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because it's safer here. He's like, yeah, for sure. You know how many people in our job have bodyguards for the rest of their lives in the U.S. because they fucked with the Colombian cartel? She's not going to back down. No, she won't back down. OMG, I just realized that Cabot and Tom Petty had the same haircut. Hmm. Oh, hey. Yeah. I'm posting a side by side because. <laughs> oh, yeah. Very well. There ain't no easy way out. Nothing. 
Oh, no. Uh, sorry, I was... <laughs> <laughs> You're like, that's enough songs. <laughs> Branch wants to drop the Zapata case and let the feds finish it up. Yeah. Too many people have died already. Right. At the trial, Cabot asks that the case be dismissed, and the judge dismisses the charges. As smug as Zapata goes to leave, U.S. Marshals show up and arrest him for the murder of a U.S. agent. He's hard staring at Cabot on his way out. And she is shocked as well. It looks like she has no idea what's going on. Yeah. Now we're at a restaurant. The whole gang and Cabot are sitting at a table. I should have included her because she's part of the gang. What the fuck? Whatever. Craig gets off the phone and lets them know that Zapata was connected to the car bomb by the FBI and that Zapata is going to flip on Cesar Velez. If the DEA can get an indictment, they can extradite Velez. Zapata will get a reduced sentence and a new identity probably. Munch and Toots are like, whatever, we're out of here. See you guys. Stabler, Benson, and Cabot stay at the table after the others leave to discuss whatever. Cabot is upset that Livia didn't get the justice. She's pissed about how the system works and she says, even when we win, we don't. The three walk out of the restaurant and a fucking black SUV. I always want to say SVU. A black <laughs> SUV pulls up and they get shot at by men. Stabler gets up and runs after the car, gun drawn. He's like fucking sprinting, dad sprinting. T-1000, just like yeah. he's going to catch that fucking vehicle that can get up to 115 miles an hour. Yeah. It's crazy that like there's so many cars in New York. But he's like... got the glutes of a frog. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Benson's on the ground is calling for Cabot. She's been shot. Benson goes over and puts Ugh. pressure on her wound and asks someone to call 911. Her eyes are open, but she's like not moving. And she looks like she's dead mm. and it's scary. So now we're yes. in the squad room. Benson's staring off in the distance and looks down at her badge. It has a black piece of elastic over it. And then the camera pans over to the front page of a newspaper. Cabot's fucking dead. Ugh. Kragen comes out of his office and asks for... <laughs> Craigan just comes out of his office like, what's next, guys? And he asks for updates on a different case. Stabler's super annoyed. Like, come on, dude. Yeah, give us a second. Yep. Someone comes over to Craigan and hands him a note. Zapata was found dead in a holding cell while waiting for his hearing. Was he, though? Okay, hold on. Yeah, because Cesar Velez had him killed. Yeah, but I thought Zapata was the top guy. No, Velez. Cesar is the top guy. Cesar's the top guy. Oh, and Zapata is his first dude. Yeah. Oh. Cesar would have to be um, extradited. He's in Colombia. Okay. Hammond has asked to see Benson and Stabler about closing out on the case. Craig gives him an address on a piece of paper. Stabler and Benson meet with Hammond, and it's out in the country, kind of, or in, on the outskirts of the city, two blocks away from the precinct. <laughs> yeah. Hammond leads him over to an SUV, and he's like, she wouldn't take no for an answer. She's a real pain in the ass. Cabot comes out from the back seat. Oh, my God. <gasps> Benson and Stabler are shocked. Benson has tears in her eyes and she's like your funeral's tomorrow oh. Cabot apologizes Cabot will be in the witness protection until Velez is extradited or otherwise dealt with oh my god they're expected to go to the funeral and everything by the way mm -hmm. Cabot gets back into the car she smiles at them as the door shut she has this like little scarf on too mm. it's her traveling scarf I guess yeah. Benson and Stabler watch as the car drives away, lights flashing, which I feel like they wouldn't do to not draw attention to themselves, but whatever, you know. Um, yeah. Also, they're, they're like, like wee -oo, wee -oo, somebody <laughs> important's in this car. <laughs> wee -oo, wee -oo. <laughs> they're supposed to go back to the precinct to some of the people that trust them the most. I mean, Cragen, Munch, Toots, any of these people. And they're like, how come you guys aren't as broken up as we are at Cabot's funeral? We're avenging her death. We're going to look into this. No, <laughs> no, we're not. We agree with Craig and we should probably just move on. We, we've got other stuff to do. City never sleeps. Right, right guys? Oh, right. man, I'm so mad. I'm so mad that she's obviously dead. <laughs> Because she's dead and it's going to be forever with her being dead. Toyota! <laughs> Toyota! <laughs> like, I don't under I don't get it. Yeah. I want yeah, yeah. to no. know. Okay. Pablo Escobar. El Padrino. Don Pablo. The king of cocaine. I literally know nothing about this guy. Just so you know. Really? I yeah, I nothing. Know. There's so many shows. You never watch Narcos? No, like I don't like that shit. You've never seen Blow? Yeah, I, I saw that a long time ago. Okay. The only thing I really remember is like his mom narking on him, and I was like, oh. But yeah. I do remember him in court being like, come on, I cross these invisible lines, and blah, blah, blah. And the judge being like, those invisible lines are actually countries. That's all I remember. Yeah, that's that's George Young. The one who... And his daughter, and his daughter never visiting him again or something like that at the end. Yeah, that's George Young. He's somebody who worked with Pablo Escobar... 
Oh. Pablo Escobar was the drug lord that he like went and visited. Remember, he was like, hey, mm. yo comprendo, yo comprendo. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, come for a ride with me on my property. And then somebody uh-huh. gets shot in the head like in front of them. Anyway. I don't remember. I do know there's a there's a bunch of memes that are made from the narco where the guy is just yeah. standing by himself. <laughs> yeah. There's also when I was uh, doing some research, there was a picture I found and I'm like, holy shit, Pablo Escobar just looked like like a bloated Chris Parnell. Anyway, so Pablo Escobar was the king of the Colombia drug cartel who led the way in writing the narrative of Colombia being the murder capital of the world. The third of seven kids, Escobar was born on December 1st, 1949. He grew up on his father's farm in Rio Negro, Colombia, while his mom worked as a school teacher. Mm -hmm. In 1976, at 27, Pablo Escobar married Maria Victoria Haneo. Conflicting reports put her at being 13 or 15 years old. Um, More things say that she was 15, but... That was his wife? Yeah, they got married. They would go on to have two children, Juan Pablo and Manuela. One thing about him that his family and others who surrounded them will still say is that he adored his wife and kids. But back to his completely other side. Escobar's first arrest was for Grand Theft Auto in 1980. 1974, but he'd been doing all kinds of shit leading up to that. As a teen, he sold fake diplomas and falsified report cards. By the time he was 17, he was in a gang stealing stereo equipment, stealing cars for parts, kidnapping people for ransom. A wild one was that he used to steal gravestones and sandblast the words off of them and resell them. Jeez. What the fuck? I know. That's really the first example of his, I don't want to say innovation, but I mean, yeah. I mean, that was something different that nobody was doing, but also his root ruthlessness because who steals like a sacred fucking mark of a dead person you know right after his arrest he transitioned pretty quickly into drug smuggling and that's when he was part of founding what would become the Medellin cartel the big cheese drug lord at the time was Fabio Restrepo to give an example of how much cocaine this guy was producing Restrepo was getting 40 to 60 kilos of cocaine to the U.S. once or twice a year beans kilo huh beans what are you talking about I just I just meant like that wasn't that much. It was it was oh for the time it was like holy shit this guy's plowing sixty to forty kilo like how much I'll t- I'll tell you in pounds. Oh I don't care that's fine. One hundred and thirty two point three pounds is sixty kilos. So at the most he was sending my goal weight in fucking. <laughs> cocaine to the u.s so escobar who wasn't new to violent crime had restrepo assassinated in 1975 and just boop took over his business under escobar this shit fucking exploded so uh, one of the quotes from the movie blow that really wrapped this up nicely was from george young played by johnny depp and he says cocaine exploded upon the american culture like an atomic bomb in fact if you snorted cocaine in the late 1970s or early 80s there was an 85 percent chance it came from us the Mm. weight count in 1978 under escobar went from restrepo's 60 kilos to 19,000 kilos wow he supplied 80 percent of the cocaine in the united states and was one of the richest people in the world at an estimated 25 billion, baby. Wow. He made the Forbes list every year for seven years. At the height of his power, the cartel was bringing in 420 million U.S. dollars per week to Escobar. Wow. Besides the regular old cocaine in a car, truck, plane, boat, or helicopter method, he had creative ways of smuggling cocaine into the States. One being inside tires of commercial planes. He could get hundreds of pounds into commercial planes just in the tires alone of commercial planes. Another way is he'd soak clothes in liquid cocaine so they'd go through any old luggage, Hmm. security, anything. Not to mention he had two submarines. So that too. It was just so much coke. At his height, there were 15 tons being smuggled every day. Wow. He and his partner set up shop on their own island, Norman's K, a couple hundred miles southeast of Florida. There was an airstrip, houses, boats, planes, hotels, a refrigerated warehouse to store their cocaine. All of this is happening. How was he getting away with all of this? I mean, it seems pretty brazen, right? So the drug trade is terrifying and cutthroat. Gabe, mm. let me tell you a little something. <laughs> And Pablo Escobar was known to be one of the most ruthless and violent leaders. His motto Mm. for getting problems handled was plata o ploma, silver or lead, which is like bribes or bullets. Either you took his money and did what he wanted or you were killed. 
simple as that. Mm. Like if you were going to do a Cabot stand up for whatever, no, you're dead. While he was in charge, it's been reported that Escobar was responsible for the deaths of over 4,000 people, including 200 judges, 1,000 cops, journalists, and other government officials. Throughout all of this, of course, the U.S. is basically in a full-on war against Pablo himself, who, being the boss, can remain pretty untouchable. Mm -hmm. But he did have one big fear, extradition. He always said he'd, quote, rather have a grave in Colombia than a cell in the U.S. Okay. In the late 80s, he offered the Colombian government a deal. If he paid the entire country's debt, which was about $10 billion, he would be exempt from extradition. But they were like, no, we can't. But he did all this shit to like get involved in government. To He was always focused on extradition laws. Yeah. Um, and he went to law school for a little while after high school. He went to college for law for a short time. So he's he's a smart guy. Good for him. At the height... Good Good for him. Yeah. At the height of his power, Escobar attempted to balance out his brutal way of doing business with immense philanthropy. The press dubbed him Robin Hood because he used his wealth to build schools, hospitals, housing, churches. He established food programs, built parks, roads, and football stadiums. Football stadiums because it was in Colombia. Football. Millions yeah. of dollars went to housing for the homeless and building up poor neighborhoods. No matter if it was working to gain favor or not, it, he still helped a ton of people. Yeah. And they loved him for it. In an interview, Escobar's son said, quote, My father's life is full of contrast and paradoxes. He built sports fields so that young people didn't use drugs, but he financed them with drug money. He was so beloved that when he ran for political office in 1982, he won an alternate mm -hmm. seat in Congress in Colombia. That was short-lived, though. In 84, he was forced to resign because of committing crimes and drugs and stuff. Mm -hmm. he, he always said, you know, I earned my money because I had a bike company when I was a kid and, you know, I'm good at business and da-da-da. And there was somebody who was running against him that was like, no, you're a, dr you're a drug lord. So right. when he was forced to resign, people died for that just like they talk about in the episode pablo escobar had an entire plane exploded just to kill one person luis carlos galan got escobar kicked out of his political position and was assassinated mm -hmm. on august 18th 1989 okay galan's successor cesar gaviera trujillo was scheduled to be on that flight he missed the flight survived but 107 people died on avianca airlines flight 203 jesus including two americans Whoa. okay so the u.s doesn't fucking like that and began really fucking with escobar the colombian government negotiated with escobar in an attempt to take some action against him for the assassination the deal was he would turn himself in but in return he got to build the prison where he would be housed okay officials were like like this was his deal this is what he came to them with and they were like are you fucking kidding of course you can do that. And he did. The prison was called La Cathedral and had some posh-ass amenities. A nightclub, casino, spa, waterfall, soccer pitch. Shut the fuck phones, up. Phones, <laughs> computers, fax machines. Like, it was... He just built himself a new kick-ass house. <laughs> It sounds amazing. He was fucking set up. It wasn't long before, duh, Escobar was running the prison like his own business. And after getting caught torturing and murdering two members of the cartel that were housed with him and the media reporting on his luxury prison, authorities were going to move him to a different prison, like a like a real one. Mm -hmm. But a little bird told Escobar that. So in July of 1992, he escaped because mm. he obviously built a door that he knew about or something. You know what I mean? It's like he just left. He was like, okay, cool. I built a subway system underground. Right. And I'm just, I'm leaving. Bye. So he took his family into hiding. The rest of his life he was in hiding. At one point, his daughter Manuela got sick, like, while they were in hiding. And he used cash as firewood to keep her warm. He literally burned $2 million in cash just on fire. Jeez. Um. It's sad to hear his son talk about it. He later changed his name to Sebastian Maraquin, but it's sad to hear him talk about having to hide with his dad. They had all the money in the world, but had to remain so hidden that they couldn't even go out to buy food and were starving a lot of the time. Mm, that's sad. Yeah. The day after Escobar's 44th birthday, on December 2nd, 1993, his Medellin hideout was found by a task force team using technology given to them by the United States. After a shootout, Escobar was found dead. It's always been speculated that the fatal shot was self-inflicted just based on where it was positioned, what he had talked about. He had had other gunshot wounds, but the fatal shot was in his ear, and he always said that's where he would shoot himself. And yeah. 25 
thousand people attended his burial in Medellin. It was hmm. a lot of the poor families that Escobar had helped and given money and other resources to. They just wanted to show him respect for how he had helped them. After all this, his family had to flee Colombia. No country would offer them asylum, and they eventually settled in Argentina. Changed their names, changed their lives. There's whole, there's continuous shit beyond that that goes on with them. When Colombian authorities seized some of his possessions, they officially collected. 142 planes, 20 helicopters, 32 yachts, and 141 houses and office buildings. Mm. Did you know that there is a hippo problem in Colombia? Hippo? Hippos aren't even native to the country. Yes, hippopotamus. He had this one property that was like seven square miles, just full of everything that you could want, including a whole ass zoo full of exotic animals. He smuggled a lot of these animals for his zoo on his drug planes. And when he died, after most of the animals were relocated to other zoos, there were still four hippos that remained on his property. They were deemed too dangerous to be handled. And they're like, just leave them. Just leave them and let them roam around and live their life. It's fine. The Mm -hmm. hippos multiplied so much that over the years... And are so dangerous that now Colombia castrates male hippos to control the population. Whoa. They'll like attack people and shit. And it's yeah, because I know. Pablo Escobar had a fucking zoo of hippos. Yeah, I know. I think there's more deaths in Africa, I think, from hippos than any other animal. Mm-hmm. They're so cute, but I guess they're just fucking brutal and they're fast. Yeah. You're like, oh, smash this watermelon. They're like, I'll <laughs> smash your fucking head. I'm 47. <laughs> I ride motorcycles. <laughs> If you were behind that screen, I'd crush your head like a watermelon. (laughs) Dude, and this is just like not even an after thing. This is like a during thing, too. There was so much cash all the time. There was so much cash. He bought a commercial plane just to haul his cash from, you know, one place to another. It was kept in warehouses. So whatever the accountant, whoever, team of accountants, I don't know, said that they averaged a 10% loss every year just because there was so much of it that it would be eaten by rats lost or destroyed some other way accidentally so you would never be able to like wrap your mind around the amount of cash that they were dealing with all the time Hmm. sebastian maraquin formerly juan pablo escobar pablo escobar's son was quiet for a lot of years before writing two books about life with his father he said it bothered him how glorified his dad had become when he had hurt so many people but he makes it clear that he loves his dad too it's like gotta be such a mind fuck yeah you know he like adored and loved his family and treated them so well and would read the kids bedtime stories and sing to them and whatever and then he would blow up a plane with no concern for who else was on it but there was one person he wanted dead it was just such Mm a juxtaposition of ideals you know Mm -hmm. and he's met with victims families to make amends for the crimes that his dad committed against them there was a documentary about it called sins of my father he wrote under his birth name juan pablo escobar i think to give cred like this isn't just another book written about pablo escobar this is like he's my dad Mm -hmm. but he did say a quote that i liked uh i would not recommend anyone enter that world because i do not know any retired drug traffickers yeah right um also it's like i don't know if it's like myth legend reality but it is said that there is millions or billions of Pablo Escobar's dollars just randomly hidden everywhere around um, Colombia. Wouldn't doubt it. It's like buried, hidden. A lot of it's probably destroyed, but yeah. Hmm. But that kind of power gets glorified. It gets glorified regardless of how much you like want it not to be. Yeah. Well, shit. I didn't know any of that stuff. Very cool and interesting and fun. You want to talk about mountain climbing next? You want to talk about that next? You want to talk about mountain climbing? Mountain climbing? It's another thing I hate. Oh, (laughs) that's another thing I hate hearing about or reading about. All right. Next week, we got season five, episode five, Serendipity, Tasha Earmuff. (gasps) Earmuff. Okay. Dead infant is found in the gutter and the gang tries to locate the mother, but end up dealing with a dermatologist and then a serial pedophile, maybe. Uh, It's going to be a doozy. I faked earmuffing because I'm going to have to hear it anyway. That sounds awful. You got to edit that shit. Ugh. You have to just like, l- yeah, let me have these once in a while. Because you're like, oh, these ones suck. You know what sucks? The, the, those ones. All the other, yeah. And these are the ones I'm like, I can't wait to see what happens, Ugh. which is awful. Yeah, rate and review us. Email us at svupod at gmail.com. Send us cards and notes and whatever you want because it's yeah. fun to have that stuff in the mail. P.O. Box 176, DeForest, Wisconsin, 
five three five three two. Check out our Instagram at SVU Pod. Join the Facebook group, which is super fun. SVU Pod Elite Squad. We also have like a little chat room. Hashtag little bit loud for all your indie pod needs. Little bit loud. And you need it. Yeah. And join the Patreon. We have so much fucking content on there. It's bananas. So much stuff. Yeah. On all the episode notes, I just started this last season at one point, but I always put in the episode notes the timestamps on the regular feed and the timestamps for the Patreon, just so you can see the amount of content that is on the Patreon versus on the regular feed. And it's usually a pretty good amount. Per episode. Yeah. 10 minutes to 40 minutes sometimes, depending on how on one we are. Sometimes, we, yeah, we go off. Sometimes we're not on one. Sometimes we're on five. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, love you. Bye. Love you. Bye. Bye. Well, g- g- love you. Bye. <laughs> Goofy movie. <laughs> <laughs> Munch and Toot speak with Faber cast Faber. <laughs> you want some cream? No cream? Okay. <laughs> Did you get it? Fa- fa- yeah. I, I went far. I was doing Farva. Oh, I was doing Farva beans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, is it fava fava beans? Farva beans. Oh my god, I want you to draw that. It's a bean, but it's it's farva. It's got a mustache, and he's like, "Yeah, you guys want some cream? No, no cream. Okay. It puts the lotion on. Shenanigans. Oh. <laughs> it puts the, the back of a truck at an Amtrak station. That sounds like me losing my virginity. <laughs> Amtrak station. So so <laughs> dummy. <laughs> Judge a doy, a doy, idiots. And then she dunks super hard. <laughs> and then Granger's like, cut it out. <laughs> and to our Elite Squad patrons, Haley K, Sonia W, Sky K, Marissa M, Elky H. Oh, Elky, thanks for the cookies, by the way. <gasps> yeah, thank you. Annie G, Mary D, Andrew, Andrew, Rebecca D, Miranda B, Shelby W, Lex, Emily T, Kayla W, Mallory G, Bonita R, Marin, Vanessa, Amy P, Jess M, Summer M, Melanie G, Courtney W, Ursula S, Emily A, Kate H, Ooh, Younga, Nicole R, Julia P, Sapphire. <laughs> I think I do it creepier every time. It's always creepy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Kayla, Catherine M, Kate P, Jessica S, Nicole M, Acacia V, Danielle W, Kelsey D, Jana M, Joshua H, Tammy J, Bear, Crystal, Lucy M, Trisha S, Sam D, Emily A, Angela D, Mac Attack, Casey W, Abby W, Alexis J, Lauren T, Cassandra S, Kaylin B, Camilla Z, Nisha G, Maggie D, K Allen, Katie M, Crystal B, Jessica P, Nada M, Zan and J, Finn, Christina D, Liana, Madison H, Emily, oh yeah, <laughs> Christina, <laughs> uh, Crystal M, Victoria B, Kelsey D, Scout G, Melissa M, and Desiree D. We love you guys. We appreciate you. You make this all possible. Love and appreciate. Pew, 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 pew. And just a reminder that our patrons are the one who make it possible to us to do a charity of the month every month. I've been posting them on Instagram when we donate and give some information on each of the charities. So I've been loving being able to do that. Yeah. Um, and it's thanks to you guys. Yeah. If you have any awesome charities, send us uh, links and we'll check it out and see. Maybe they can be the charity of the month. M- month. Not much. Charity of the Munch. <laughs> Charity of the Munch. Okay. All right. Boop, boop.